And here we go. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, so my name is Jennifer Wilson, and I'm the Assistant Director of Education with the Rhode Island Historical Society. And I am so excited to moderate this evening's conversation, Making History, Trinity Reps, the Prince of Providence. Every year, the Historical Society chooses a general theme for our programming and events. And in 2020, our theme is Spotlight on RI, during which we were looking at performing arts history in the state. It obviously is a perfect opportunity to highlight the Prince of Providence, which Trinity Rep debuted in 2019. The play tells the story of controversial mayor, Vincent Buddy Sianci. Uh, and tonight we have three wonderful panelists with us to share their unique experiences in telling the story of Buddy Sianci, George Brandt, Rebecca Gibble, and Mike Stanton. So our speakers tonight, uh, George Brandt's plays included, include Grounded, Marie and Rosetta, Into the Breaches, Tender Age, and Elephant's Graveyard. His scripts have been translated into 15 languages and performed in 22 countries. Uh, by such companies as the Public Theater, the Atlantic Theater, Cleveland Playhouse, and Trinity Repertory. He is currently working on a stage adaptation of Mike Wein I'm sorry, Mark Weingartner's novel, Crooked River Burning, a musical version of The Land of Oz, and an adaptation of Grounded for the Metropolitan Opera with music by Janine Tesori. Rebecca Gibble was born in Syracuse, raised in New Mexico, and now calls Providence home. After earning her MFA in acting from Brown and Trinity Rep, Ms. Gibble joined Trinity Rep's resident acting company in 2013 because she believes local art is essential to a thriving community. Rebecca has voiced over 200 audiobooks for companies like Audible and HarperCollins and has appeared on screen in titles such as Law and Order, Law and Order, that's my Rhode Island accent, Law and Order SVU, Netflix's Spencer Confidential, and HBO's The Plot Against America, as well as AMC's Nosferatu. And finally, we also have Mike Stanton. Uh, Mike is a journalism professor at the University of Connecticut. He was a longtime investigative reporter and team leader at the Providence Journal, where he shared the 1994 Pulitzer Prize for exposing corruption on the Rhode Island Supreme Court. He also wrote the New York Times bestselling book, The Prince of Providence. His second book, Unbeaten, Rocky Marciano's Fight for Perfection in a Crooked World. Uh, which was named one of the best books in 2018 by The Telegraph in London, The Boston Globe, and others. He was recently chosen as a Boston Globe Spotlight Fellow, funded by the Hollywood producers of the 2015 Academy Award-winning movie to support investigative reporting. He lives in Cranston with his wife and two children. So thank you all for being here with us tonight. Yay! Um, so I'm going to dive right into some to questions. Um, the first question I wanted to ask, uh, the first three, uh, two questions will be, um, I guess, contextual questions um, for Mike and George. Mike, your book, uh, The Prince of Providence, was published in 2003, and it became a New York Times bestseller. And George, you had the enormous task of taking Buddy Stancy's story, which was already incredibly dramatic, and transforming it into a play. Um, what originally compelled you each to write about Stancy, and in what ways did you collaborate on this production? Hi. Okay. I was muted. I muted my microphone. Um, so yeah. I wouldn't have background noise and I couldn't unmute. So thank you. Um, thanks for everyone for coming tonight. Um, and for your interest in Buddy Cianci, which I share. And I think the fact that you all find him so compelling, um, kind of half answers the question as to why I found him compelling. Um, I had the, uh, good fortune and sometimes misfortune of actually covering him when he was in city hall and when he was under investigation in Operation Plunderdome. So I was able to chronicle um, his rise and fall and rise and fall again. And, you know, as contentious as he could sometimes be with me or with journalists in general, um, he had a little Donald Trump in him in that, you know, he loved to attack reporters, but he also loved gossiping with them. He loved having them around. Um, he loved the game. And he actually, you know, maybe it was that Machiavelli saying, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. But he actually invited me into his inner sanctum during his trial. And for the week that the jury deliberated, um, he had me in his office with him. We were just hanging out and he would tell war stories. And um, we actually got along pretty well. And so I thought he was just a really great archetype of a, of a political character, an illustration of power and charisma. And, and then he really embodied not just a, a 
a great character in Providence, but a great American character, a political character. And I thought you could tell a lot of the story of America through him and through Providence with its rich history that he embodied. Yeah, all right, hand off. Hand off, <laughs> I'll, I'll, yeah, hand off. Uh, um, yeah, so then uh, I came into it in, in 2017. Um, uh, uh, I was working with uh, Trinity at the time on Into the Breaches, um, and that was up and running. And I believe it was then that Tyler Dabrowski, who worked at Trinity, uh, wondered if I might be interested in, uh, in adapting uh, Mike's book. And uh, yeah, so I was, and then Mike and I, uh, we had a lovely uh, brunch. Um, <laughs> I think you had just seen Into the Breaches and we had some French toast um, and sealed the deal. Um, and uh, yeah, and then, um, and then I personally, you know, had lived in Rhode Island for about eight years. Um, uh, my wife, Laura, went to grad school at Brown Trinity and then was hired um, at Trinity after that and uh, worked there under many hats. Um, so I, I didn't have, I didn't have personal run-ins with Buddy, although, well, <laughs> I don't know. Do I tell the story? Sure. Uh, he did kind of hit on Laura um, <laughs> when she was interviewing um, for Brown Trinity. So uh, we did have that connection. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so I felt like I knew him. Um, but uh, that's a whole other story. Um, but anyway, so yes. And then um, uh, it was really exciting to get this opportunity because um, as you all may have noticed, uh, you are theater goers. Um, uh, the size of, of plays have kind of shrunk over the years um, to, you know, there's many one person plays and two person and three person. The casts are tending to get smaller and smaller until we'll just have robots. Um, <laughs> And uh, so this was an opportunity to do something big, like Trinity gave me no limits on cast size um, or the scope of the thing. Um, so that was really exciting to me. Um, and yeah, and then, yeah, the big, so that, that was what drew me in, I would say. Um, and the chance to work with someone who was such a larger than life figure um, and so important and I have a lot of friends in Rhode Island, a lot of friends in Boston, you know, everybody was like, oh my God, you wouldn't believe the city before he came along, you know, and, and would tell me these stories or horror stories of, of the <laughs> 70s. And um, so it was really to dive into that history of a place that I'd uh, lived in for um, uh, eight years was great. And then also the chance, I think, to... Um, work on something like it's rare that you get a chance to work on a play that's about a community um, in the community where it's written as and then on top of that to have a play about someone who actually was in that theater physically and in fact even really affected the trajectory of that theater um, which he did by, you know, uh, kind of providing uh, funds for Trinity every now and then, helping them out. So it, that was really exciting to me, um, all of those things. That's, that's why I took it on. That's awesome. Um, do you both want to talk a little bit about how you collaborated on this um, between writing and then Mike as kind of the fact checker? Is that how that worked or...? You want to go ahead, George? You want to take oh, that sure. first? Oh, um, sure. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, Mike was really gracious and, and uh, kind of, you know, told me to just have at it um, and that he would, you know, chime in um, and I could use him as a resource. Um, so the first draft, I pretty much, I think I, I think I might have emailed you a few questions, Mike. Um, yeah. I can't remember what they are now, but... And then, then we had our first um, kind of reading of it. Um, actually didn't know Mike was gonna be at that reading. <laughs> so I found out a half hour before and was terrified. But, okay. uh, but we had a reading with the full cast um, and, and pretty much, I think it was like 40 or 50 um, uh, like super fans of Trinity in yeah. uh, listening to it as well. So it was a rather, <laughs> rather huge debut for a first draft. Um, and that was a little terrifying as well. Um, 
but yeah, then after that, you know, that was kind of when Mike and I probably started, you know, talking more once he kind of saw um, the idea of what I was going for um, and what I'd chosen to focus on. Um, we had a chance to talk a little more um, about uh, a concrete um, nuts and bolts of it. And I know certainly once we started rehearsals, particularly those first couple of weeks, um, Mike was there with us in the rehearsal room, and it was so great to have that resource to be able to just turn to somebody at the table and ask them, wait a second, is that right? Is that right? You know, what actually <laughs> happened? Um, and like, I don't know, I don't think I'll, I probably will never have that opportunity again to have uh, someone who knows the topic that well um, there at the table with me. So that was really exciting. Yeah, and, and for my part, um, you know, I've had friends that have written books, and I've heard the whole range of whether the author participates, doesn't participate, likes it, hates it. Um, and and my, my philosophy was to know my lane. I'm not a, a playwright. And to just kind of, um, you know, I'm fascinated by storytelling. You know, we all do that in different ways. And I was kind of fascinated to kind of be a, you know, a fly on the wall and watch the process. And, and I felt, you know, like I could give my two cents and not have to have the weight of trying to, you know, distill this into a play. And, and I marvel at the job that um, George did. And I think one of the questions uh, raised in advance of our talk tonight was, you know, the whole idea of do you take liberties? Do you stretch the truth? Do you embellish? Do you create some fictional devices? And I don't think George really did. In fact, I was stunned at how true to the story he was, even little details. Um, and, and it was really interesting. And every now and then there'd be a little thing we would tweak like, oh, well, Buddy wouldn't really say that. And, and I thought one of the interesting things, and I also give the director Taby credit for this, um, who did a wonderful job, was we really wrestled collectively and individually with how to handle um, the darker chapter in Buddy's past of the rape when he was in law school and accused of raping a woman. And I actually talked to the woman and, and I, I think, you know, that he did do it. Um, but there was some, that was interesting how that evolved in the play. And, and, and I thought there was a real integrity there to the process that, you know, we don't just want to create a cartoon character and, you know, we want to present the, the truth. And I thought the way it was handled, you know, it wasn't in there in the earlier draft. And, and even during the, I can't remember the exact stages, but even during, I think the play, you, you changed, you were, I mean, you were doing rewrite every day. And I don't know if that's typical for, for plays, but it was remarkable to watch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and I thought that was a great example. And the way you brought it up, because here we're trying to compress his life over four decades into a stage play. And, you know, are you gonna tell it chronologically back when he's in law school? No, that's gonna be hard to do. I had the same issue in the book, but you actually presented it at the trial of Plunderdome. You actually aired it out there. And, and I thought it worked so well. It was like you made the point, but you didn't, you weren't gratuitous about it. Oh, thanks, yeah. Yeah, that was something that definitely, yeah, it wasn't there in the beginning. Um, and uh, as you said, Tavy, um, Magar, the director, and, and I were in constant, um, <laughs> constant conversation about the script as it developed. Because really, we actually, as I think about it, we didn't have an actual workshop. Um, it kind of skipped that step. So we kind of went from hearing it out loud once to then going into rehearsal. Um, and so it was kind of being workshopped as we went along, which, which which was it was a real uh, it was exciting but it was also a challenge, <laughs> um, so we were all yeah I mean uh, Charlie Thurston's character Herb um, changed quite a bit over the course of things over the course of those six weeks or whatever we had um, we were yeah I would say maybe that was also one of the bigger um, changes um, was that character. Uh, where he started from and where he ended and, and Charlie, you know, kind of kept rolling with it. God bless him. Um, and we, and we really on. collaborated on that character too. What's that? So that voice, What's that, that, Becky? that vocal choice that yeah. was so different than any way I've ever heard Charlie Thurston speak. I'm married to it. Yes, so yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, right. Full disclosure. 
Matt, can can I ask you about your experience? Because you played Sheila Stancy, you played Buddy's um, Buddy's wife, uh, and from my understanding, Sheila was reluctant to be portrayed initially. Um, so, what was your experience? Because you developed a relationship and trust with her. So, how did your experience go from rehearsals to production in this friendship, and how did you portray some of that is historic and alive and sensitive to this? Well, we, uh, you know, uh, George was saying that it's a once in a lifetime experience for him to have a writer in the room with the expertise of, of, of Mike Stanton while we're forming this play. It's like we're driving the car down the road and trying to build it at the same time and, and to have Mike this, this master knowledge on the spot, it was invaluable. And for me, that was, that couldn't be more, I, I couldn't overstate it because before we began I can't remember how it happened. I, I think I reached out to Tyler um, Dabrowski, who was the associate artistic director at the time. And I said, I think there's any way that I could meet Sheila because I knew that she was still living. And he reached out to Mike and Mike very generously reached out to Sheila. And from my understanding, Mike, you know this better, but from my understanding, she wasn't interested in meeting at the beginning and you were pretty tenacious and presented it a couple of times uh, and arranged for us to, to meet up all three of us. And I, I think that first three, that first meeting was three hours. We thought it was going to be like 30 minutes, 45 minutes. And we ended up sitting at this little, her, her regular spot. I don't want to give it away. She loved uh, but we went to her regular spot and ended up sitting and talking for three hours. And I, I think there's something about, I mean, there, she, she has, I don't want to speak for Sheila ever, but my understanding is that Sheila has always been portrayed by the news media in a certain, in a certain light or, or by buddies people in a certain light. And it's different when you're talking, I think, to artists that are interested in nuance and interested in questions rather than answers. And so I think she sensed that curiosity and that openness that is I, that ideally is part of making a piece of theater as opposed to making a piece of an entertainment even or or uh, even an in, in interview that that could be a little bit sensational and that in the news and and I think she could sense that this was not a thing that was just going to be from Buddy's perspective um, and she decided to to trust us. Um, yeah, Mike at one point went to the bathroom. Oh yeah, there we are that first day. <laughs> Look how beautiful she is, oh my God. She's such a stunner. Um, but Mike went to the bathroom and, and she just started talking and I came home from that first meeting and my husband, Charlie, or Du Simone, went, hey, how was it? And I went, I started to talk and then I took a breath and went, I have to go upstairs. And I went upstairs and I sat down and wrote for another hour and a half and just tried to write down everything that she told me because the stories, they, it, was, it was astonishing. And Mike, on the way home, you were expressing that, you know, those were stories you hadn't heard yet too. So the floodgates opened and then we actually hit it off really well. She's got like a great kind of graveyard humor that is so much fun and her quickest wit quickest wit in the east so we we had a great time and i think when the next time we met at like 3 p.m for martinis and i think we were there till like eight <laughs> <laughs> so we, it was great it was really it was a singular experience that yeah. i remember uh becky that even a year before when we did uh, when we did the first table reading of george's first draft and there it's just random actors it's not necessarily who's going to play the part but i remember you played sheila that day and i could tell you really wanted to play sheila I and did. um yeah and and so when i introduced you you know sheila had there were stories i hadn't heard but there were a lot of stories she did tell me when mm -hmm. i was working on the book but they were off the record so i couldn't use them and so we always had a great rapport i love talking to her like you said she's very funny and very witty and um, and she's been through some really dark times too, and maintained her sense of humor and zest for life. And so I knew after that first day, I, it was just like, we were like sisters and, you know, I could just hand it off. I didn't have to be there to facilitate after that. And it was really interesting to see how your relationship 
kind of brought her out of her shell and helped her deal with some stuff that was in her closet. Yeah, that was an interesting experience for me too. And, and springboarding, like the idea of what you all were talking about of how do you compact, you know, 20 years into two hours. One of the things that I was wrestling with during the process is because a lot of those stories had not been present in the book, there was no way to bring them into the play. And so, yeah, I don't want to, I, I won't, of course, go into specifics until Sheila is ready to tell that on her own, but there was, she would be comfortable with me saying that there was a lot of abuse, both emotional and physical, that she had never spoken of publicly. And when she was speaking to me about it, I started wrestling with the fact that that wasn't presented at all in our play because it wasn't in the book. So then, you know, how much, I think the question became for me as we were running it, how, how much control does Buddy still have over this narrative, even beyond the grave? Because when the book was being written, he was still alive. And that was one of the things that Sheila expressed was that when the book was being written, he was still alive and she was still under threat and under, under in danger if she spoke. So then he's still controlling the narrative even, even, even past his expiration date. Yeah. But that a lot. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really fascinating, um, really fascinating thing to, to consider. I originally, for everybody, I had sent the panelists some questions and Mike addressed it a little while ago. Um, I have this, I have a vested interest, obviously, at the Historical Society in historical fact, right? Um, but fact is sometimes complicated um, by all these nuances. So how do you tell that story cleanly, complexly, um, sensitively to others and kind of in this production in particular, like where does fact live and what has to be amended or adjusted for all of these nuances? Yeah, uh, that was definitely, you know, obviously one of the big challenges. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, there are several composite characters in the play who are kind of, um, you know, two or three people rolled into one. Um, when that happened, I tended to make up a new name um, just because I, you know, didn't feel like, well, that's not actually this person because they didn't do X and Y, but they did do Z. Um, and, um, and then the aforementioned Herb character um, uh, carries over into Act 2 into Buddy's second administration in a way that he doesn't in reality. Um, in reality, you know, Buddy gets a whole new uh, group of, um, uh, of uh, supporters and in his inner sanctum um, for Buddy for his second reign. And initially I was going to do that, but then it was like, you know what, we've already got like 20 characters. <laughs> like to ask the audience to now, okay, now here's his new team like just seemed like a bridge too far so uh you know with, with you know the uh give uh, uh, uh appeal to the uh gods of facts and fiction i i kind of went with that and kind of allowed that team to stay with him um throughout his career um so that was one of the bigger ones um uh but you know i mean as mike said i mean i really did try to stay with um, you know, the truth as much as I could, you know, I mean, it's hard because immediately, you know, we don't know these conversations. So immediately a play that's all about conversations is going to be all made up. Like, so already you're working off of that. So that in some ways frees, you know, frees a play right up to kind of have added a bit more. Um, I was blessed in this occasion, however, having said that with, you know, through Mike's book, you know, so many great quotes uh, of both Buddy and these, these people who surrounded him. Um, there was no, uh, no dearth of, uh, of great quotes. In fact, there were too many great quotes <laughs> and uh, there was no way to squeeze them all in um, or else there wouldn't be a play. It would just be Buddy, just, I don't know, stand up Buddy or something. Um, but uh, yeah, so that, that was, that was the that was you know probably the big challenge um uh and and as becky said you know we'd get information from some of the real people who were still around that 
you know, it's like, ah, like I'd like to use that, but I kind of can't, or it doesn't quite fit with the narrative we've got going, or we already have a scene like that, or, you know, um, I think the big, the big challenge with it was just kind of trying to find the spine of it. Um, and, uh, because there are so many anecdotes, you know, about uh, Buddy and Mike's book that are also great. Uh, but, it, you know, you can't just do a bunch of anecdotes either. Um, and anybody's life is a bit more scattered than fiction, um, you know, and it goes a million directions. Um, and yeah, so there were things I had, right, like Buddy's kind of flirtation with, uh, you know, leaving Providence and, and, you know, running for higher office, that kind of, kind of, uh, was de-emphasized, let's say. Um, uh, so choices were made and, you know, anybody who lived through those times, I'm sure, uh, were kind of noting each <laughs> deletion or addition as it went on. Uh, but I tried to stay faithful as best I could um, to the events that we were focusing on. Well, there was one point, I think it's one of your more inspired scenes in an overall brilliant script, was near the end, when he's at Pride Night. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. You created that in a way, it's, it's a very kind of, you know, almost like a fantasy scene because he's having hallucinations of his daughter right. and his late wife and his late girl, his departed girlfriend. And, um, and you, that was a real scene. And you took a real scene of when I went to Pride Night to watch Buddy during the deliberations in his trial. And again, that time that I talked about Buddy keeping me close, he saw me, he invited me to ride in the parade with him. We went to a gay, a couple of gay bars later that night and he got really boozy and sentimental. And some of the words, it was almost like what you did is you took that scene and then you riffed off of it and you substituted Charlie's gold painted independent man for me. And yes. you had right, right. the exact things that he said to me that night, and then the way you riffed off of it, I thought it was it was brilliant. So obviously there were flights of fancy, um, but it was very grounded in the truth, and even his kind of regret. And and I remember one interesting thing at the table reading, the first draft, you had this kind of mythical thing where once a year on Pride Night, the right. real statue of the Independent Man comes alive, and he walks oh, around. Right. To the top. <laughs> And I remember my wife and I were at the reading. I said, oh, wow, that's really great. And then you kind of changed it to just he's one of the revelers. And it was fine. But it was just a really, um, I mean, I love that scene. That's one of my favorite scenes in the play. Yeah, I like me too. And, and in the book as well, I just, I just, it's, it is, it's so specific and strange and, and just all kinds of bizarre, but real, you know, and, and but because you were there uh, literally. So um, it was great. Um, I don't know. It's just, and, and yes, it was hard to cut that. Yeah, originally the independent man was kind of the narrator for the, for the play in a way. And yes, and towards the end there, he was able to, <laughs> the one night he, he can wander the streets of Providence without um, and calling attention to himself was Pride Night. Um, which yeah, I thought was kind of fun. Numbers in that original but, one too, I remember. <laughs> He's sang a couple songs. Yeah, there were a few more songs. <laughs> right, yeah, we had a few more songs. In That's there. a great example. <laughs> you were talking about how you have to sacrifice content for the story. And my editor used to always tell me, kill your darlings. And it was a very clever yeah, device, yeah. but I don't think it would have worked if you'd kept it that way as well. Because the way the play starts, we jump right into the action. We don't need like some third person there. Right, and, right. Um, you know, even when they're singing Rhode Island is yeah. famous for you, it's famous for, and then buddy, <laughs> even that. right into it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let me yeah, ask this. It was this. hard to lose. <laughs> um, so let me ask this. Um, because Buddy Stancy is that larger than life politician and he wanted to leave this, um, this enormous legacy. Um, his story though is so heavily situated in Providence and in Rhode Island. What's the resonance of this story beyond Rhode Island? Um, where does it go from here? How does it feel for other places? Mm -hmm. 
I think it resonates. I mean, my book yeah. resonated and it's yeah. not because of me, it's because of <laughs> the subject matter. And yeah. I mean, when you look at Crime Town as well, that, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. What is yeah, it? That was good timing. Yeah. Um, so what do you think it is about to come out right before <laughs> <laughs> I was actually re-listening to bits of Crime Town um, as I was preparing for this. Um, what do you think it is about Buddy Stancy that resonates elsewhere? Um, and or what was it like to come to this play in 2019 during controversial political time? Um, sure. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think any time you get somebody who is this, I mean, he, he, he was larger than life and he did create such strong passions in people, whether they loved him or hated him, it was usually strongly. Um, and we had even, even in our, amongst our cast, <laughs> people were a little divided amongst how they felt about him, which was really fascinating to me. Um, uh, there were people who would have voted for him again, you know, within our cast. And then there were people who hated him <laughs> with a passion. Um, I think, I mean, I think Mike's book, you know, Crime Town, I think, I think any time you get these characters, I mean, it wasn't just Buddy, it was everyone around him who were eminently quotable and and I think in some ways the specificity of the Rhode Islandness is also an appeal to the story um, outside of Rhode Island. Um, I think people, um, I know from, you know, family and friends who saw the show who don't live here, you know, they were very engaged and on a different level than, because they didn't know the story. And they, like my parents came in and they kind of thought I'd made the whole thing up, you know, <laughs> um, and, uh, at breakfast the next morning, I was kind of going through, no, that's actually real, that actually happened. He actually <laughs> said that and, yeah. you know, um, uh, I mean, and, you know, I mean, just going off on Mike's book, I mean, there's a whole other play there, you know, there's, a, there's so much material. Um, and I think anytime you get a political story that, that, that is, I mean, I think any, city, any state, you know, has got a political story that's similar, you know, um, that, that at some point in their, in their cycle, there was someone like this who came along. Um, and as you say, you know, at that point, we did have a national example of, of, of someone with a few similarities. Um, and that was an added um, uh, bonus of, 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 of things to riff off of, I think, for all of us. Um, to riff off the reality that was happening outside the theater um, and, in a satisfying way um, and just to be able to comment on that in our own way. I think yeah. also, George, the way that you figured, I, I think the reason to take it back to that independent man changing the framing device, mm. the reason that, that that change worked so beautifully is because of the way that you then delivered the ending and that that the, the sum of the parts wasn't ultimately about this charismatic, larger than life man. He was like the, I don't know, not the Trojan horse, but, but right. the, the mechanism to make us look at ourselves and, and look at what we are willing to support within our mm -hmm. political structures and within our cities. Um, I think the reason that it, it is a piece of theater that should go other places and, and could resonate with audiences outside of Providence is because it, it, it asks us to, to look beyond what, what is this person giving to me directly? Can I, can I stand behind all, if, if I'm not, even if I am profiting directly off of this and benefiting directly, is it just, it, do, do the ends justify the means? Like all of these really big civic minded questions that we are dealing with in, in huge ways in this moment. It feels like a, a play that should go other places. I really hope it does. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I totally agree. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was funny, even with now we're in this, you know, strange world of a presidential transition. And um, I was reading stories about how Mitch McConnell is not going to be approving uh, cabinet members for Joe Biden. And I, I thought of Buddy in his first term, 
when the you know he was the Republican mayor right. one since the depression and all Democrats on the council basically said we're going to make you a one term mayor and they wouldn't approve any of his cabinet uh, choices and then he he pulled a maneuver where uh, you know a couple of the Democrats on the council got indicted and went to jail and were off the council and then one night a couple others went down to the bar and skipped the meeting and suddenly but he had a majority on the council and he ran through all these resolutions and, and appointments and he basically took control. And it's that, that raw power that is kind of a universal thing that people, especially when politics is on everyone's mind, I think people are drawn to, to those stories. Mm -hmm. I've also noticed uh, th there's a thing about Buddy that I think is different than what I what we're experiencing on the national level is that anytime that I meet some anytime I meet anybody in Providence they have a personal buddy story but yeah. whenever I meet them and they tell me their personal buddy story there's always a sense of joy and glee and excitement about it no matter which side they come down on so there it's like I don't I don't know from the story whether they were supporters of buddy or anti-buddy I just worked the polls uh, in this last election. And I, mm -hmm. I worked at the polls with the, uh, it, he was the city planner, Mike, for eight years under Buddy. Uh, and he was on the stand, he was questioned uh, for three hours by the prosecution. Uh -huh. And he started telling me stories and I was like, oh man, this is a big <laughs> Buddy supporter. And then about two hours later, I gleaned that he was actually not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, but it, it was in, it's interesting that that is my experience always. I can't tell whether they were pro or, or con at face value because there's a, a sense of joy and glee in talking about their experience with him, which is well, really yeah, yeah, that is really strange. Um, look, at, look at the play when um, George had all these wonderful scenes where Buddy would interact with the audience. Right, right. And I sat in the audience a lot of nights watching. And there would be these moments that Buddy would go into the crowd, which the real Buddy would do, and he would have his Polaroid photograph taken with people, or he would hand them a jar of his marinara sauce. And so every show, I think like three people got Polaroids taken and three people got right. marinara sauce. And the, the people were so excited. I was walking out of the theater one night and there was this old, older woman in front of me and she was holding a jar. She was, I got a jar of marinara sauce. <laughs> I was so excited. You know? Yeah, little That's did I know. I didn't know people were going to be fighting over that. Yeah. <laughs> I thought they were going to be annoyed, but no. <laughs> but yeah, I think as we're saying, that really sets him apart from, and maybe he was the last, I don't know, politician to do this, but uh, uh, just the, the level to which he got out into the community. Um, you know, is something to be commended. I mean, you know, he really got to know his constituency in a way that, um, you know, I think, I think you might go and hear somebody talk and say, oh, he was a good speaker. And maybe five people get to shake his hand afterwards. But, but the, I mean, Buddy's driving around town, you know, till 4 a.m. hopping out of the limo and shaking somebody's hand, you know, and going into their backyard barbecue. I mean, that's, that's a different, <laughs> Yeah. That's a different person uh, than most politicians, I would say. And even though, Mike, I know in your book, he would sometimes complain about it. Um, he's like, oh, these people expect me, you know, to shake their hands and they have BO and all this <laughs> stuff. But, but, but it seemed that he genuinely enjoyed it as well. So I don't know. As with all things, he was very complicated. He needed it. He was a lonely guy at heart and he needed mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And affirmation and interaction and he, he was the king of retail they called him right mm -hmm. that's what the phrase i was trying to remember yes a retail politician mm. that's really fascinating um can we go back to um this idea of everybody has a buddy story because i'm really fascinated with that um obviously working in the store excited so um for context for everybody i'm at the john brown house and i'm kitty corner from buddy stancy's uh power street address uh, uh nice. Yes, the infamous uh, cigarette story, if we will. Um, yeah. Um, so I guess my my question is, what is it like to tell the story of somebody who is um, so well known and somebody where everybody already has a formed opinion? So I, that's kind of for all of you, Mike, for the book, um, Becky, George, for the play. What is it like to tell that story for somebody where like everybody already knows this guy? <laughs> well. 
for the book, I mean, I think I, I wrote in my author's note that everybody has a buddy story. He's part of the, you know, the streets and the buildings. But mm -hmm. um, the thing I found, like any story, that as much as ubiquitous as he was, there was so much that people did not know about. And when I started, set out to write the book, Operation Plunderdome had just begun. And I saw the book focusing solely on that with maybe a, mm -hmm. a only chapter to kind of cover everything up to that. But it, the first half of my book wound up dealing with all the events leading up to the infamous nightmare on Power Street with Raymond DeLeo. And it was so fascinating. And a lot of people never really knew that stuff or they knew the shorthand version. And so, yeah, for me, it wasn't so much a worry about uh, buddies, fans, or haters. I mean, because I got criticism and compliments from both sides. So I think as a journalist, it's, I think it was a little easier for me than maybe it was for um, the stage, but I don't know. Yeah, I would say for me, it was, it was so exciting every night to be in that audience. Um, I've never had an experience like that where it was almost like a Greek drama where everybody knew the story going in uh, and they just wanted to hear how it was told. And, and I didn't know how well people were going to know the story. And I was just amazed, just like the moment, you know, you know, Ray DeLeo comes on stage for the first time, you know, half the audience is like, <laughs> oh boy, you know, and I was like, oh, wow, like, I don't have to, <laughs> I don't have to work that hard. No, um, but, but it was amazing. Um, just the kind of delight you'd feel and the electricity in the air um, with people seeing, you know, and as you said, Mike, that, you know, there were some moments they were more familiar with than others. And, and, um, and then at, at intermission to walk around and, and, and everybody's kind of explaining to each other, um, oh, was it the cigarette and then the log or the log in real life and then the cigarette or, or did this really happen or did that happen? Oh yeah, that happened and all these debates. And um, I, it was just so much fun. Um, and you know, I was nervous every night, <laughs> but every night was a, was a blast. Uh, and sometimes, you know, I'd end up sitting behind people who were in the play as characters. Yeah. Uh, and those, you know, those were tense for me. I did not announce myself. Uh, I just kind of was uh, allowed myself to be a fly on the wall. But but even people who, <laughs> you know, were, were uh, did some pretty dastardly things in the play were just laughing and and, and turning to each other and and I don't know. It it was it was a, it was a trip. It was a trip. Well, Becky, how was it for you, the first night Sheila came? Ah, oh, gosh. So it was it was really intense. I've never performed in front of the person I'm portraying before, and then also to have made a deeper relationship with her during that period, and then all of a sudden I'm telling her story in front of her was it was kind of mind blowing. But it was also a lesson in expectation because. It's 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 true of of the the folks that I talk to about Buddy that I can't ever quite tell where they come down, what's what side of the fence they're on. And I remember standing up there at the end of the play, and this was a moment where I think I think at this point we were still doing this post show speech that uh, the executive and artistic directors, the management of the of the theater had negotiated with the oh, CNC right. Foundation. <laughs> Remember this? That yeah. then Scott, the man that was portraying Buddy, step forward and say, you know, if you'd like to, there would be people collecting donations for the, the CNC Foundation in the lobby, please donate to, you know, he's, he's doing, his, his name is still doing all of this wonderful work. And I was standing there and, and there were, I was trying to be really calm and there were tears rolling down my face because I felt like it was a moment that really, put a stamp on the play saying like, we stand with Buddy, he is a hero, is what I felt like that moment was saying. And I was so upset about telling Sheila's story and then having that be. And afterwards I met her in the lobby and I was very nervous. And she was like, that's such a kick. That's exactly what they would have done. That's exactly what he would have wanted. <laughs> it's so perfect. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and she thought it was a hoot. And I was, of course, then I had to like go back and reshuffle my, my expectation 
that I was putting on Sheila and how much of it is my feeling versus what, what the actual fact is. So it gets back to that idea, that slippery notion that we're all grappling with right now of fact versus truth versus expectation. And oh my gosh, it's so complicated. Yeah. But I think your performance and the play really liberated Sheila. And obviously Buddy is dead, so she didn't have to worry about him. But I think it really brought, and she, she came back many times. She did. Yeah. Yeah. This cut out of Buddy that I took from the, the theater. Oh, you got it. That's you. Um, there's, <laughs> there was two of them. Okay. And the other and I, one is with Sheila. I delivered it to her house and we put it in. <laughs> She's like, how do we put it? And we ended up putting it in the front window facing out. So she said that all of her neighbors are going to start calling and, and saying, he's in your house. Do you know he's in your house? <laughs> it was pretty funny. She decorated him for different holidays. It's, she's, she's that's hilarious. hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a sequel. It's interesting, yeah, too, because it, there's like a certain amount of, uh, oh, my back? Yes. Yeah, you cut out for a second. Yeah. You're good. Okay. Cut out for a second. Good, good, good. There's a, a certain amount of complication as well with, with anybody telling their own body stories because I felt like one of the things that Buddy brought to people was this, was this spotlight. And so uh, no matter what, for better or for worse, Sheila was thrust into the spotlight because of Buddy. And so I think that there's a, a, a love-hate that goes along with that because of of the kind of notoriety and access that that grants too. And I, I would imagine that that was true with anybody that was close to him. Yeah. Wow. But she went up like you and Amanda Milkovitz, who wrote the story about the two of you for the Globe and Sheila, the three of you went up to WGBH in Boston and you were on the, right. with Jim Brody and, and she loved yeah. that. And I, that was a very she liberating did. thing. Although on the, on the drive up, I, I remember on the lead up, at first when I approached her about uh, the, I think I spoke with her first about speaking with Amanda Melkovitz from the Globe. And then after that, I believe Amanda approached uh, us about the WGBH television spot. And immediately she said, no, 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 I'm not interested in that at all. Absolutely not. And it took like a two or three more conversations for her to, so she, she's not somebody that seeks the spotlight at, at all, but like you're saying, Mike, I think once she got there and began talking and saw, I think she has a lot of, and I think justifiably, you know, Buddy kind of put the fear of God in her that he was going to turn people against her. And he worked really hard to do that in the city and, and successfully yeah. sometimes. So I think she always approaches anything in the public eye with, with a little bit of trepidation that it's going to be twisted and, and used against her. And so it was really huge when this play didn't do that. And then when when Jim, Jim Browdy over at WGBH was looking at it with a really even hand, when, when Amanda did that beautiful article that, that really portrayed her in um, a, a sympathetic and understand, it was, a, it was like the first time that she could step out in front of the, the specter of Buddy, um, even though it's still couched in her and in, in her relationship to Buddy. Yeah. I can't wrap my, arm or my, eye, my brain around what that would be like to have even after you divorce the man and he's dead and you've escaped this 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 abusive situation that that even then when when you're approached to be in the public eye it's still in relation to him that would be so complicated yeah Oof. yeah um so we have a few minutes left uh and i had a couple of questions from our audience tonight um so the first one um Let's see. I love the ending of the play. Could you discuss why you chose to end it that way? Sure, yeah. Um, uh, that was actually the first idea I had when, when Tyler approached me about doing uh, the adaptation. Um, I kind of thought about it for a little while before saying yes. And um, that idea, basically, of the ending um, came to me. And, and that, was, that made it really interesting interesting to me this idea of um i don't know kind of really of not 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 just putting up buddy's story um uh, and somehow divorcing that from trinity you know or or trinity presenting buddy's story 
I don't know, without that other part, the fact that he actually did save the theater a few times. Um, and so the ending, yeah, the ending was actually the first thing I wrote too when I got around to writing the play um, <laughs> and pretty much stuck with uh, with it throughout all the drafts. Um, it got shorter, um, but the basic gist of it um, stayed the same. And uh, yeah, it, it just seemed to me, um, I mean, you know, it was a kind of a scary uh, jump off the cliff there. Um, uh, but I kind of like to see it <laughs> with those things work, um, uh, those terrifying things. Um, but uh, yeah, but I just thought, I thought, I thought to me that was really exciting, um, just having the actors, you know, be themselves at the end and, um, and to have even the students kind of um, uh, question about their culpability. Um, uh, that, that seemed really rich to me. And, and I was, again, so scared uh, until that first preview when, when people really uh, dove into it. In fact, we almost had to try to temper elements of it because um, uh, sometimes it got so, the feeling got so pro-buddy in the room um, mm. uh, that the audience would be cheering things that, that I kind of intended to be a little more complicated um, to say the least. So we kind of, <laughs> Tavy, the director and I kind of had all these meetings about, okay. And it, it got weird because, you know, in some ways, we were uh, doing the exact opposite of what you normally try to do. We are trying to tamp down the applause, yeah. uh, which is not the usual move. <laughs> um, but uh, we are both uh, contrary people, apparently, because that's indeed what we were trying to do. Um, but, but I think we ended up with kind of a, you know, hopefully a middle ground, although it really did depend night to night on uh, the makeup of the audience. I mean, there were still some nights where it was like, you know, a celebration in there. Um, in a way that, you know, I, I hope, I hope people weren't shouted down too much if they had a contrary opinion. Well, what was great about it was that as you're going along through the play, like you said earlier, everybody knows how the story ends. Right, right. So you're trying to figure out, well, how's he going to get us out of this? <laughs> right. You know, how's he going to get it without just a formulaic ending? And it suddenly we're off the rails and we're into yeah. like, buddy land. And, and, and I remember, like you said, the first, the preview weekend, the whole cast, you know, Buddy walks off and, you know, what was I guilty of being there? He walks off and the cast right. is looks at, and they start singing Rhode Island is Famous for You in a very kind of rejoiceful way. And then <laughs> what you did to tamp it down was you just had everybody walk off and it's just Charlie dressed as the independent man singing it very right, mournfully. Right. And, then the the, and then the stage yeah. goes black. And, and, and still, in silence, you know. Some nights, some yeah. nights, we they would start screaming and and clapping along before he was done. It, it was really wildly different every night. Yeah. But all exit, all of us would exit and then stand in the. Usually, you exit into the wings and like go get get a drink or like start thinking about where you're gonna get your after show snack. And we all would literally crouch in the wings and listen really <laughs> carefully to see if they were going to stay silent. And, yeah. and when they would stay silent through the blackout, all of us would kind of like give each other high fives. Like we kind of did it tonight. <laughs> right. That's great. And God bless. Again, this is maybe too much Charlie love. He's going to get a swelled head, but you know, Tavia and uh, I were like, uh -huh. don't, you know, wait for, you know, like dive into that silence. Like don't let, the applause from the audience stop you. Wait for that to stop, no matter how long you have to wait. And there were nights he had to wait a very long time. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. Yeah, he but, would walk off sometimes and go, oh, God, they make, made me work for that. <laughs> it was hard. But he was patient and- He was heroic. God bless him. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so I, and one, as as I don't want to give Charlie too much love because I want to also give Becky, know, Becky uh, some love. <laughs> Because, uh, you know, you are, you are a couple there and I don't want to sway things too far in one direction. No, I, I, I because, think Becky, I was just so excited to uh, 
uh, you know, it was fun to write the, the role with you in mind. And then I just thought it would be fun one for you because I hadn't seen you do anything like that before. And then to see you rise to the occasion uh, so magnificently. Oh, thanks, blast. George. So, thank you. You wrote me such a great, oh my gosh. I've never lobbied for a role before. It could be <laughs> like, we don't have a say in casting. And right, right. People, people feel comfortable saying, hey, I'm really interested in this. And I'd never done that before. And I made a fake tweet because Sheila announces the engagement in the paper before, you know, that's how oh, she's, okay, yes. we're getting married. <laughs> um, and so I made a tweet that was announcing my casting as Sheila Cianci and I made a picture of her next to a picture of me and I sent it to Kurt to be like, give, <laughs> give me the role. <laughs> I didn't hear that one. <laughs> he did, he gave it to me. Thanks Kurt. <laughs> yes. So I have, I have one last question from the audience. Um, what are post-COVID plans for the play? Where does it go from here? Is there such a thing as post-COVID? I, what do yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, you know, it was scheduled, as uh, mm -hmm. some of you may know, to come back this next season that I guess, are we in the middle of it now? No, we've started what would have been this, this, okay. season, this lost season. Um, yeah, so it was supposed to be next summer, I believe, the tail end of this season. So, um, yeah, so, you know, we kind of kept, kept moving the dates until finally we couldn't, <laughs> couldn't deny reality any longer. Um, but hopefully, you know, I, have a, I imagine just because, you know, the play did go over so well, hopefully whenever the theater comes back, mm -hmm. Uh, it'll be part of that. I, I know it's not exactly the uh, poster child for, um, <laughs> you know, uh, the COVID conditions with a, a huge cast and all these costume changes backstage. And, you know, so that is a challenge. Maybe we'll have to write the, the three person version with people with wigs. I don't know. Um, but, uh, but we'll see, you know, hopefully hopefully it will find a way to, to for it to make a comeback in the next the next time trinity can can you know hopefully hopefully re-enter the world as a proper theater soon yeah yeah i yeah i, I think that trinity has every every intention of bringing it back when it's safe to go and i i can't wait especially yeah, like having be fun. having the lens of the last couple of years uh, yeah. on top additionally of layered right. oh so interesting really yeah. fascinating yeah we thought yeah. things were crazy back then <laughs> a year ago <laughs> little did we know yes. <laughs> Everything so much can happen. happen oh my god yeah. right but it'll be yeah like you say to dive in there again uh will be an awful lot of fun yeah, that's awesome. Well, I, I look forward to it. There's been so many comments in the chat about how wonderful everybody thought it was, how much they enjoyed it. A lot of love to all of you. Um, wonderful conversation. Thank you all. Um, so yeah, thank you all so much for this. I'm seeing some rounds of applause from folks virtually. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, everybody, um, for coming. And thank you, Mike and George and Becky for this. It's been lovely. Thank you. It's it's thank, seen, you, it's, right. thank you, Jen. Yeah, for yeah. putting this together. Yeah, yeah, thank you. It's good to see you all. And it, it's good just to hard to imagine it was just a year ago. I know. Yeah. That's thank remarkable. I saw yeah. somebody wants wants an adaptation of your, your next book, Mike. So maybe we'll talk. Yeah. <laughs> that would be a good one. Yeah. That all sounds right. great. <laughs> Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Peace everyone. Uh, All right. Take care. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye, Rhode Island. And Betty Cannon. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Bye. Bye.